Back again, you poor people are hearing from me multiple times. Sorry about that. Schedule just worked out that way, I guess. But we're delighted to be here. It's always great to see everyone. Each of you are very special to us, and we love you. The Jesus Movement, some of you may have heard about it, was an evangelical Christian movement that began on the West Coast of the United States in the late 60s and the early 70s. It primarily went through North America, of course, Europe, Central America, Australia, and New Zealand. It finally subsided in the 1980s. Now, those of you who were around at the time probably remember it because these individuals who were part of this Jesus movement were called Jesus people, or even worse, Jesus freaks. They were saved out of the drug culture in San Francisco to start. These were people who were genuinely saved. However, if you saw them, you think they'd still be part of the drug culture. They dressed like they dressed, but it was amazing. It affected music. Christian music became very vibrant, very real. And uh, one of the things that I remember is the slogan that they had. And there's still shirts that are available that say that kind of thing printed today. The shirts read one way, one way. And that one way meant that there was only one way to God, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the Jesus movement. This morning, we continue our series about the lives of Bible characters who chose paths of life independent of the Lord. Nothing to do with the Lord their own way. We've talked about Rahab and the self-worship that was part of her life. We talked about Nebuchadnezzar and power that was his choice in his path for life. We talk about a third person, a lady this time. And our purpose really is to learn the self-destructive results of these choices made. Hey, I'm living my life. I can do what I want. Yeah, maybe. But likely that path will lead you down the wrong way. And that's what we've seen happen in the lives of these two individuals before, and we're going to see it again today, all based on a choice that they made in life. Not God, not anything to do with God. I don't believe in God, they would say. But their choice was whatever it might happen to be. Proverbs 4, 14 and 15 says, Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it, turn away from it, and pass on. To these people, they didn't at first. They didn't at first. The proposition I've suggested in the past is that God knows us. He knows us as individuals from the day of our birth on. Oh, you mean great people like Billy Graham or, or someone like that, right? No, everyone. For God so loved the world, and you're part of the world. So God is involved in our lives, and he's trying to win you to himself. Each of the people that we've looked at in the past and will today and will next time found the one way to God through Jesus Christ. That's the difference. The person we will consider today, and no, it's not Easter, the person we'll consider is Mary Magdalene, a woman who lived during the time of Christ on earth. Mary Magdalene chose the path of wrong belief, the path of wrong belief. And you're going to see why in just a minute. Our scripture comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Don't turn to it yet. We will walk through it as we get into the text itself. Uh, we're just looking at verses 11 to 18. We'll begin with a walkthrough of Mary Magdalene's life. Then go over the scripture text, John 20. 11 to 18, and conclude with takeaways for people who have chosen that path and what God said about it and what the solution is. So let's go through a walkthrough of Mary Magdalene's life. We do not know very much about her, but maybe we do more than we think. You can imagine the day of her birth. It's a girl, beautiful, intelligent, strong-willed child. She was named Mary. Like many in Israel at the time, it seemed like the more you read the Gospels, it's Mary this and Mary that. 
Why? Because Mary was related to the name Miriam, who was Moses' sister. So to name your child Mary was like naming the child Miriam. There was also the meaning of the word Mary, and that was obstinate or rebellious. Mm, don't know whether I want to give my daughter that name. Mary grew up in Magdala, M-A-G-A-L-A, -A -A, sometimes called Magadan, on the west coast of the Sea of Galilee. It's one of the little towns that were around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Mary could daily see the tower for which her city was named because Magdala is the Greek form of Migdal or watchtower. So there was a watchtower in that city. That's what you knew Magdala was. Now, the city of Magdala was located just three miles away from Capernaum. Well, what's significant about Capernaum? Capernaum is where Christ made his headquarters here on earth prior to going south into uh, the area around Jerusalem. Now, Mary's family may have been involved in the production of dye for coloring fabric and the making of fine woolen clothing. It seems that most of the people in the area were involved in this type of business, so it's not too much of a leap to say that's what Mary did and her family. Now, I mentioned Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. The city of Magdala was located in the northern section of Israel, and that's Galilee. Jerusalem's in the south, Galilee is in the north. The city of Magdala had a population mix of both Jewish people and non-Jewish or Gentile people. There seemed to be more Gentile people in that area. Now, they know that there was a significant Jewish population in that area because they kept records back then of how much contributions were made by the Jewish people in Galilee. And as a matter of fact, if it was large enough, the money, the gifts, the, the tithe, whatever you want to call it, was sent in a, in a wagon because it was so much. The area of Magdala was one of those three cities that had to use a wagon to send their money. So there was a Jewish population. They were giving to God. They were very significant in their beliefs. The downside is that Magdala also had a notorious reputation for moral corruption. It was almost like some cities in the United States, some parts of New York. You go there because you want to escape rules and regulations. You live the way you wanted, and immorality was not a problem. Now, Mary Magdalene's had a path of life. She made her choice, and that life choice was, was done when she was probably a very young person. She decided upon a path which focused upon gods other than the God of Israel. Yes, I'm Jewish. Yes, I grew up with Jehovah. I know all that stuff, but I don't want it anymore. I've talked to my neighbors. They all follow other gods. Her path was the path of wrong belief. She was placing her emphasis on the wrong being. Her path would go from rebellious behavior to rejection of the Lord God, and from false worship to demon entrapment. Yes, there were demons then, powers, fallen angels that would take possession of individuals. It happened a lot during that time. Deuteronomy 32, 17 and 18 says, they sacrificed to demons, not to God. To gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. Of the rock who begot you, you are unmindful and have forgotten the God who fathered you. She forgot the God that fathered her. Her family may have been followers of God, but not her. She was young enough. She decided to go on her own. So back to her life story, her middle years. She quickly made her fortune. She made a lot of money, and so did the family in what was being done. That's hinted at by the fact that the tithe was so large, it had to be shipped south by wagon. She had all the money she would ever need. She was pretty happy. 
Yet her life apparently seemed hollow. Maybe that's why she reached out in a lot of different directions to find something to believe in, something to follow. Maybe she did some things that were not so good as far as the business was concerned. A wealthy young woman who was now making the wrong path of life. She was surrounded by many non-Jewish Gentiles in Roman-controlled Galilee. Rome owned Galilee. That was part of the Roman Empire. Now get this, the people of the Roman Empire were primarily a polytheistic civilization, which meant that people recognized and worshipped multiple gods and goddesses. There was a god for everything, and they worshipped gods and goddesses, and more. They also worshipped spirits. There would be a spirit of a river, spirit of a tree, spirit of fields, spirit of buildings. Everything had its own spirit. This was a population that was truly not following God that we know. It appears that Mary Magdalene rejected the teachings of the Jewish scriptures, which she heard all the time growing up, including God's control of her life. She would disobey what she was taught and behave as she pleased in spite of what she knew about Jehovah. Hey, I'm young. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to do whatever I please. Follow God, one God? No, no, no. I'm going to be like my neighbors, following gods of Rome, spirits. It appears that Mary Magdalene rejected the teaching of the Jewish scriptures in addition to the God's control of her life. Christian counselor Robert uh, Roger rather, Buford writes, a central theme in practices which lead persons into demonic influence is an unwillingness, get this, an unwillingness to accept God's sovereign control over the conditions of life, including health, possessions, relationships to others, status and social influence and knowledge of the future. She was curious. She wanted to take a bite of the wrong kind of apple. The lifestyle of sinful and rebellious actions apparently led her to fascination with false gods and spirits, which in turn opened her up to eventual demon possession, the demons that I mentioned earlier. Very real, very real. If you read the Gospels, you run into the demon possession thing a lot. The more she got involved in it, the more she bought into that, first one demon indwelled her, then two and others until she was indwelt by seven demons who completely took over her life. Making this up? No, very real. Dr. Luke mentions Mary's condition prior to being rescued by the Lord Jesus. Mary Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. Then there were the side effects. A Bible-focused organization makes this statement, physical, mental, and spiritual disorders increase exponentially during possession, and the confusion, anguish, and mental filth caused by unclean spirits can result in insanity. Not one, not two, but seven demons. We don't know what side effects were the result of the seven demons in Mary Magdalene. We don't. It's not recorded. She might have manifested one or more of these disorders. Now, what I'm going to list are five stories that talk about demon possession's side effects. The first, severe physical disability, Matthew 15, 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. Another situation, but number two, inability to speak. Matthew 9, 32 to 33, as they went out, behold, they brought to him a man mute and demon possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled, saying it was never like this in Israel. Number three, inability to see. Matthew 12, 22 to 23. Then one was brought to him who was demon possessed, blind and mute, and he healed them so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. 
Number four, epileptic and self-destructive, Matthew 17, 14 to 18. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. One more. Unable to control themselves. Luke 8, 28 to 30. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. Mary had seven demons in her because she was playing fast and loose with the wrong kind of God. Mary's demon possession made her an outcast from her family, that family that was part of that business that she did with dyeing, developing dyes, and making clothing. She often spent time alone and in remote places, most likely. British preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon writes, it strikes me that very likely her being a demoniac had so separated her from all human sympathy that there were none that loved her, none that cared for her. Likely, the Lord Jesus saw Mary Magdalene in the course of his travels in her area. Remember, I said Capernaum was just three miles away, and Christ covered all of Galilee and came to see her. The experience of having seven demons cast out of her was likely painful and difficult, but Christ did it. Mary Magdalene was rescued. The demons were cast out, and Christ received her into his kingdom. She became a follower of the Lord Jesus. Now, the experience of having seven demons cast out of her was likely painful and difficult. Again, Mr. Spurgeon, it is a well-known fact that the devils never went out of men willingly in the Savior's day. They had always to be cast out. You find them foaming at the mouth as soon as Christ is seen. And when he says, I command you to come out of him, the devil tears the man, rolls him in the dust and subjects him to unusual spasms of pain and agony before he will depart. Thus, seven devils have been driven out of Mary, forced out of her. Christ rescued her. She, she went down the path of wrong belief. She left God. She focused on herself. She dabbled in other religions, in other beliefs. And it then tripped her right into demon possession. Mary became a reborn woman after the demons were cast out of her. Again, Spurgeon, he gives us a look at Mary before and after. Listen to this. Had you met her after her cure, you would not have known her by, to be the same woman. Those disheveled locks no longer remain to identify the maniac, and those strained eyes and that tortured brow and all the air and bearing of a distraught one. All these were changed. She was admitted into society as a reasonable being. She was taken into the family circle as a welcome member. Jesus became her teacher and his apostles, her friends. She showed her love for the Lord by becoming his servant from that day forward. And you know what she did? The money that she had earned because of that family business, she donated to the Lord to help the Lord in his ministry, to pay for the expenses connected with his mission throughout Galilee and beyond. And she followed him along with some other women who also paid out of their wealth. She gave her resources to help pay expenses as the Lord traveled around Israel. Luke reports that Mary Magdalene and the other women of means provided for him from their substance, their money. 
Christ went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the twelve were with him. The glad tidings. She was the example of what happens when Christ rescued her. Mary gained not only a position of prominence in the Gospels, but also a position of leadership among the women who follow Christ. How do we know that? Mary's name is often first on a list of the women who follow Jesus. Just like Peter's name is always first in the list of the disciples. It means authority, prominence, service. Okay, that's what we learn about Mary. We don't know much about her. We don't know her age. We don't know if she was married. We don't know any of that. But what we do know, we've talked about already. Now, we'll look at the scripture text itself in John 20. But before we do, there's some things that you need to know before as background. First, the order of visits to Christ's tomb on Easter, on Resurrection Day. Here's the order of activity. Some women, including Mary Magdalene, come to the tomb where they find it empty and are told by one of two angels there to go to Peter and the disciples and report that Christ is risen. Next, Peter and John run to the tomb where they find the linen wrappings empty, proof that Christ rose from the dead, and then they return home. Mary Magdalene comes back to the tomb, standing outside weeping, where she speaks with one of the two angels in the tomb and meets the risen Christ. Number four, Christ later appears to the other women near the tomb. And lastly, as the day goes on, the Lord joins two disciples on the road to Emmaus and later appears to Peter as well. First bit of background, just understand what was going on at the tomb and Mary's place there. Second, the garden tomb, as it's called, was owned by a guy by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. He was a secret disciple of the Lord, as was Nicodemus, who met Jesus Christ, and it's recorded in John 3. Now, it was a garden tomb. What does that mean? All gardens in Israel in that day, if they were rose gardens, they were within the city. Anything else, any other type of garden was always outside the city. These gardens were owned by wealthy people, among whom were Jewish families, and they contained tombs made from existing caves or cut into nearby rocks and were attended by a gardener. A guy was on staff to take care of these gardens. When Christ died, he was taken right from the cross and they wanted to put him nearby into a tomb. There wasn't much time because as the day would end, Sabbath would begin and nothing was allowed. So the best place to do it was in that nearby garden that Joseph of Arimathea owned, not that far from where the crucifixion took place. Okay, last one, background. Mary Magdalene was an observer of all that went on regarding the death of Christ. Mary was at the cross as the Lord Jesus suffered and died. John 19, 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. Mary also observed Christ being placed in Joseph's tomb and the burial preparations. Mark 15, 47. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. Okay, now to the story in John 20. As Mary stands outside the tomb, she is crying. She then looks into the tomb and sees two angels. John 19, 25 says, I'm sorry, John um, 20, verse 11 and 12 say, but Mary stood outside by the, t uh, by the tomb weeping, and she wept the stoop and stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Mary's sense of grief may have driven her back to the tomb. She had been there initially. Things looked strange. He may not be here. Then the two angels in the tomb asked Mary why she was crying. 
She replied that someone had taken the body of her Lord away and she didn't know where the body was. Verse 13, then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. She was looking for the dead body of the Lord Jesus. Now, the word it's mentioned here, weeping, which they ask her about, really is the Greek word that means sobbing. It's not merely the tears were trickling down her face. She was convulsed with her weeping, totally upset. This one who had rescued her, who loved her, and she followed and had given her new life, was seemingly gone. After she answered the angel, she became aware of someone standing next to her. This person asked the same question that the angel did and posed a second question to her. Verses 14 and the beginning of 15. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Mary Magdalene, perceiving either by the looks and gestures of one of the angels or by hearing a noise, she saw someone who was behind her. Mary thought this man was the gardener, remember? The gardener. So asked him if he carried the body away, and if so, where it was so she could take it herself. What's interesting about that is she had seen the preparation that preparation of the body where spices and so forth were put in there to kind of retard decay initially. The spices weighed about 75 pounds. She was going to lift the body of Christ and 75 pounds of spices that had been wrapped into him and carry that body back. Verse 15, the second part of it, she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Matthew Henry, that English commentator, writes, Another evidence of the strength of her affection was that wherever he was laid, she would undertake to remove him. Such a body with such a weight of spices about it was much more than she could pretend to carry. But true love thinks it can do more than it can and makes nothing of difficulties. The Lord Jesus then spoke to her by just saying her name. She responded with the what she called him from the start. Teacher. Teacher. Another English preacher, G. Campbell Morgan, writes, then he said, Mary. Morgan writes, I cannot interpret that in any tone of voice of which I am capable. So as to reveal the significance of that, Mary. It is possible to utter a name in such a way as to call back all memories and reveal all endearments. That is what Jesus did. He just said, Mary. Jesus then told her not to hold him as not to let him go, since after he returned to the Father, he would be close to his brothers and sisters spiritually. He would go to heaven. And lo, I'm with you always, he said. He told them as he left, and he would be. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary thought that with the resurrection, Jesus would resume normal relations like before. She was trying to cling to the joy she discovered in her resurrected Lord. He's back. He's alive. But his fellowship with her would come in a new form. Jesus had not yet ascended to complete his return to the Father, but the process was underway. Before his final departure, he would give the Holy Spirit the spirit of the living God would indwell, be inside everyone, including Mary, not demons, God's spirit himself. 
And finally, Mary obeyed her Lord by telling the disciples that Christ had risen from the dead and that he would ascend to the Father. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Mary Magdalene obeyed her commission and became what someone has called an apostle to the apostles. She became the apostle to the other apostles. Remember, Peter and John had gone home. Mary stayed. And we doubt that this great privilege was given her as a reward for her devotion to Christ. She had followed him all the way, ever since the demons were cast out of her. An incredible story. Let's talk briefly about the takeaways. First takeaway, your path of wrong belief is condemned by the Lord. I can believe whatever I want to believe. Sure, you can. But do you want to have the right belief? The belief in the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy 6.14 says, You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. And people have all sorts of belief. They think this is the right way. That's the right way. But the Bible says the end thereof is destruction. It ain't going to work. Through Christ, God works. So-called gods are claimed by those around you, but there is only one true God. I can tell you all sorts of things. I can create beliefs left and right. But there's only one true God, and that's the God that's mentioned in the Bible. First takeaway, your path of wrong belief is condemned by the Lord. Second takeaway, your rejection of the Lord's path of life is on you and will bring punishment. It's your responsibility, your choice. Ezekiel 18.20 says, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. And get this, the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself or herself. You're making the decision. Your rejection of the Lord's path of life is on you and will bring punishment. First of all, his path works. These other paths don't. But the rejection will be on you. There is what the Bible describes as the great white throne judgment. It's there that the dead of all ages will be judged. Yep, judged. And at that time, you'll just be sentenced. It's too late. The judgment is on you. You have the opportunity now as God's spirit is whispering to you. Third takeaway. God is calling you by name. As he did to Saul on the road to Damascus. Saul was a person who was so wrong in his belief. He was following a wrong belief and he was killing those who were Christians who were following Christ. They had it right. He had it wrong. So God stopped him on the road, literally appeared in a bright light. And what did he say? Listen how he uses his name. Acts 22, 6 to 8. Now it happened as I journeyed, Paul talking, and came near Damascus at about noon. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Saul, Saul, Mary, put your name there. He knows you. He's seen you from the beginning. He's not willing that any should perish. But it's your decision. Now is the time to choose the path of life. God knows every detail of your life right up to this moment. He is today showing you the foolishness of your plan of life, whether it's having a wrong belief or some other self-centered plan. 
Mary's involvement with the wrong belief brought suffering and confusion to her. Your wrong choice will also bring disaster to your life. Oh, that'll never happen. Hey, listen, just read about the celebrities that we hear about. They're doing great. Plenty of money, plenty of fame. And then you read some things. You can't believe what's happened. There was a painting, a very famous painting by an Italian painter, Leonardo da Vinci. It's called The Last Supper. It was his attempt to picture each of the disciples and the Lord Jesus Christ at the Last Supper together. When he painted, he painted each of the faces individually. And he didn't just make up what they looked like. Of course, he didn't know what they really looked like, but he picked individuals out to be his models, if you will. He got the one person in and he was to be the one who was Christ. So he painted that man's face. And then there was Peter and John doing individually till he covered the whole thing. Except when he got to Judas, he did not know what to do, how to paint him. He made tours of the jails in Milan at the time. And in the jails, he wanted to find criminals. He wanted to find people who were hard as nails, people who would appear to be the type of people who would turn against Christ, would sell him for 30 pieces of silver. He finally found a person. And he brought that person in so he could paint him. And he discovered to his shock, it was the model he used for the Lord Jesus Christ. The man had had a hard, bitter, and sinful life, ended up in jail. Physically, he was affected. So he looked like Judas, not the Lord Jesus Christ. The story is, yes, interesting. But what it means is, what you sow, you will reap. If you plan a life that pushes out God completely in your life and ignores the Lord Jesus Christ's death on the cross for you, that ignores the sin in your life, it's only downhill from here. You must turn to the one true God. That's who we're called to do. He is, as it were, standing behind you, just like he stood behind Mary, saying your name. He cares. There is only one way to God. The Jesus people had it right. One way. And that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he died on the cross. He went to pay for your sin. Everything you ever did wrong has been put on him. Why? Was it fair? No. But it took it off you. And now the offer of salvation is there. And God has a way of speaking to you. Telling you, this is, this is the real deal. This is the real thing. And you have the opportunity to make that decision. Oh, yeah, you have the other opportunity, too. You can say no thanks. But realize, as the old expression goes, you're playing with fire. You're taking a major risk. When we pray, I would ask that you silently tell him that you repent of your sin and accept him, Jesus Christ, as your Savior and make his way the path of life for you personally. That's when someone says, would you like to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you in particular? Let's close our time in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, this woman was incredible. What a life she had. And you saw her from the start. 
She got herself in so deep she couldn't get out. We don't know what manifestations she had. Maybe she couldn't speak. Maybe she couldn't see. Maybe she was very friendless and love, loveless. Dear Father, we pray that you would speak to hearts today. That people here who do not know Jesus Christ would not play around with this. Life is too short. Dear Father, we pray that people here would silently ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into their heart, repent of their sin, and receive Jesus as their personal Savior. There is only one way, Father. We thank you for it. Thank you for Mary's example. Help us as believers to ask your spirit to strive with the people who are here who know you not. Thank you for this assembly. Continue to bless in its leadership, in its direction, and its service for you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for rescuing us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.